So, welcome Sebastian. Yay. Hi, I'm here. Hi, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> hello. Right, then, so, well, thank you, Gloria. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, okay. So, um, let me see. First of all, the camera's pointing this. Uh, I'm going to stand about here. So, you've got the camera pointing. Right. So, for. So, so basically, um, I'm going to just just do a quick run through of what I thought wasn't really getting out on the mainstream media. Last time I was here, I tried to explain that what, how I defined the whole of the modern world. I'm not going to try and do that this time. I just want to quickly rush through um, some economic stuff. If you're a graph junkie, you will love this. But basically, um, uh, where, during the, 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 the Brexit referendum, um, Remainers were coming out with lots of arguments that I thought were very suspect, and they all tended into, to fall into one of these five categories. Conjecture about the future, personal opinion about the character of individuals, trying to demonstrate general correlations from specific examples, um, citing reports produced by EU-funded organisations, or attempting to compare that which can be observed with something that we can only speculate about. And so these, these were fallacious arguments, and I was curious about this because the thing that generally these arguments have in common is that they're not, if, if you're familiar with um, a, a philosopher called um, Karl Popper, these arguments aren't scientifically falsifiable. There's no observable test you can do to demonstrate that they're false. And so there's, there's basic logical problems coming from this. And I thought, what I worked out and what I wrote about in the Brexit Canton Othello book is that basically within the modern world there's a, a huge systemic war against empiricism and uh, the idea of um, uh, uh, you making up your mind depending on the information that you get from the world and you being informed from nature and society and, and the planet. And what people are doing instead is um, uh, we'll, we'll come on to that in the end. I'll get on to that in the end. First of all, I'm going to go through some graphs, right? So, this, if you're a graph junkie, you will love this. Right, so, first of all, when Edward Heath, so for, we're going to talk about trade, because um, Heath took us into the EU with the promise that it would help trade. That was his, uh, he said, it's help, it'll give us an export market. And he took us into the EU without bothering with a referendum at all. And so, let's find out if Heath was right. Now this is from the Office of National Statistics, and this is the balance of trade from when records began in 1955 to now. Okay, so this is the sort of graph that I like, and I'll be showing a lot of graphs like this. This is the whole data set. There's other data sets that have only started up in the last 30 years, but I really prefer these because it shows generational trends. It allows you to compare now with what we had 60, 70 years ago. So this is the graph with all of the balance of trade data for the last 70 years. And you see where I've done the red squiggle, that's custom. You can get the ONS data and you can chop it into specific historical time periods to find out what happened during different times of history. And all of this is on my, word, my website, the Blue Anchor WordPress, WordPress. And so there's links there so you can go onto the um, Office for National Statistics Statistics website and just double check just to be sure that I'm not fabricating or making up any of these graphs. They're all in the public domain. Okay? And what the, what the ONS do is they tend to put out um, data releases. There's a load that's going to come out on the 22nd of December. They put out these data releases and they, they err on the side of pessimism and then later on they'll revise it up depending on how wrong they were. And so there's a few here at the end that have just been revised up in the last couple of weeks. And so it does get sort of post rationalized So this is all the data ever for the last 70 years on trade. So let's see what happened. I'm going to use that custom thing to chop it up. So this is the zero line. When we have balance of trade on the zero line, that means you've got equal imports and exports. You've got balanced trade. Okay? And so this is from records began 1955 to 86 when Thatcher signed the single European Act. And so when she signed the Single European Act, that, in terms of trade, that began, that began our integration into the EU. And you see the, the line, it bounces around more and more, but generally it's stuck to the zero line. As the currency devalued and as there was more and more trade, it bounced around more erratically, but we generally stuck to the zero line. Now let's see what happened after she signed the Single European Act. Okay, right. 
So this, this is the collapse in, the, in our trade balance that happened after we joined the EU. And so as we became more integrated, you see the collapse became greater and greater the more we were integrated. And so basically, by the end of our EU membership, we had a greater trade deficit with the EU per head of population than the United States had with China. It was huge. And so the whole point of joining was to fix our trade balance and it did precisely the opposite. Now, let's see what happened after the vote to leave. I'm just going to scroll down. Now, ah, oh. but, but, but that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> after the, there's the vote to leave and our balance of trade has been improving at 2,500 million pounds per year ever since the, 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 the vote to leave. Oh, <laughs> don't, don't thank the Tories for that. So, so, now I'm going to go to the next graph. So here is the same graph that I've already shown you before. But here I've just done, uh, um, done the time period for the last 25 years. So this is the last quarter of the century. And you see the red circles. That's when we achieve balanced trade. And so you see there's one red circle here in the last millennium, 1998, and then none at all for the last 20 years of EU membership. And then after we left, oh, what a surprise. We got balanced trade four times in a row after we left. Well, what, that, that will knock me down with a feather. We became an independent democracy again, and we went back to balanced trade. Well, who would have thought it? So, now, but trade summary. Before joining good, during membership collapse, after leaving recovery. Now, how, how clear do you want it to be? You don't need to be like Piketty to, to understand these graphs. Okay, next, unemployment or employment, however you want to call it. So, because after all, when I was talking about trade, that could just be an isolated incident, right? That could just be that I'm cherry picking a particular data set. Here's unemployment. When was unemployment at record low? Well, when I circled it, 3.5%. Where, where I've circled it, that's when unemployment is at 3.5%. So we see, curiously, is that 3.5% just before the 1975 referendum to remain in the European Union, and then just after we left, uh, after the vote to leave, it went back to 3.5%. So we, we, we voted to remain, unemployment quadrupled, we voted to leave, and it went back down to a record low. And so for the whole period of EU membership, unemployment was about double what it was when, uh, before we left, before we joined and after we left. Hey, but that's probably just an isolated incident, right? It's probably just a coincidence. Well, <laughs> let's see. Now, this is unemployment since the vote to leave. And so, George Osborne said 840,000 people will lose their jobs. He was talking out of his hat. This, he was speculating about the future, and a chief characteristic of the future is that it doesn't actually exist. So it contains no facts that we can empirically observe, right? And so, when we look at the empirical evidence, Unemployment was 4.9% when we voted to leave. We see that the, the, the COVID bump here, it's gone up lately because uh, in the world there's a sort of the Ukraine supply shock, but still, even despite COVID and Ukraine, unemployment is lower than the vote to leave. Exactly, precisely the opposite of what Remainers swore would definitely happen. But they were just a bunch of sort of Nostradamuses like Brexpocalypse is always just around the corner for Remain. Okay, employment. Here we go. Employment, look at the 75% line. And you see the 75% line all the way along. But suddenly, you can't see it anymore because employment has gone above the 75% line for the first time ever in, in, since, since the, the data set began. When did that happen? Ah, oh, the vote to leave. No, but hey, it's probably just pure coincidence, right? Okay, so let's see if it is pure coincidence. Oh, employment summary, before joining good, during membership, collapse, after leaving recovery. That, that's clear then, right. So, now we're going to look at GDP. This is the full data set. So now we're going to chop it up and see if there's any intergenerational trends that uh, we can observe. 8% when records began in 1956, 23% at the 75 referendum to remain. So I 
I see a line that's going from bottom left to top right. I, I don't know if you guys can see the same graph as me, but that's what I'm sort of seeing. Let's see what happened to GDP after uh, during, econ during membership of the EU. So here's a graph. Oh no, maybe it's the wrong graph or something. Maybe I'm just hallucinating. But I just see a graph that goes from top left to bottom right. It just sort of flatlines at 3.5 percent for the end of the EU membership. But surely the EU made us richer, right? Wrong. Now, what happened? Let's see, look at the next graph to see what happened next, shall we? You'll be hugely surprised that when we left the EU, it was flatlining at 3.6 percent. It's been more than double that for the last nine quarters. And you've got to remember that this is COVID, so you've got the dump and pump of COVID, and then this is when we, Johnson took us out, 2020, and it's consistently above. So we've, um, GDP growth is more than double what it was for, for years and years uh, during the last part of our EU membership. But hey, that's probably just pure coincidence, right? Like that's just, that's just trade, employment, and GDP. There, there's probably, it's just probably a sheer coincidence that they all tell the same story. Uh, GDP growth. Oh, this is another one. Maastricht Treaty. Before we leave GDP, that's when John Major forced the, the Maastricht Treaty on us, despite the heroic attempts of John Smith. And so that ushered in 30 years of dead GDP growth. And then you see the huge pump afterwards, after we left. Now, next. Uh, GDP growth somewhere before we joined good, during membership collapse, after we left recovery. Uh, clear? Right, okay, good. Wages! Right, so let's see what happened to wages. Is this graph starting to look familiar? Oh no, no, it's probably a sheer coincidence. So this is the full data set from wages from 1949 to, to current, to, to um, present. So this is wages 7% when records began, 29% when we voted to remain in 1975. I see a line going from bottom left to top right. This is what happened to wages when we were in the EU. That's why we left, okay? I see a line going from top right, top left to bottom right, okay? Uh, uh, wages, wage growth claps from 29% to 3%. What happened afterwards? <sighs> well, maybe, maybe I fabricated this graph, or then maybe I didn't. Maybe I just downloaded it from the UNS this afternoon. But I see a line. You can see that the dump because of COVID, but there's a general upward trend. Okay, but the thing I don't like about this graph is it's, if you look at it, it's quite clunky because they only update this one every year, but I like it because it's very long term. It goes right the way back to 49. So let's get a graph that updates a bit more regularly. So we've done that graph. This is average weekly earnings. Oh, they appear to be hitting an all-time high. And they've been going up for several years. And you see the dump and pump of COVID there. But it's, it's just a bump on the road to higher wages. OK, so wage summary. Before we joined good, do you remember ship collapse? After we left recovery, it spot the pattern. So we see that with wages, employment, GDP, trade, it's all the same thing. When we were independent democracy, we did pretty well. When we were EU member state, there was a collapse. And when we became an independent democracy again, we started doing pretty well again. And so what I'm doing is, if, if you just take a step back and you see, have, look at how I'm arguing. I'm taking the longest term graphs I can. I'm taking a range of graphs so that if there's one specific quarter of results that look odd, I can't use that to present a full story. I'm trying to be as empirical as possible. I'm taking a broad range of graphs over the longest possible period of time. And if we look at country after country, decade after decade around the world, what we see is when more people have more democratic control over more power, there is more prosperity. Now, if you're an EU member state, you, uh, no vote you cast can directly change laws pertaining to goods, services, labour or capital. You can vote people into an amending chamber with the European Parliament, but, but the thing is, you, you, there's no vote someone in France or Germany can cast that will directly generate law pertaining to goods, services, labour and capital. 
And if you can't vote democratically about good services, labour and capital, what can you vote about? I mean, you just, like, that's everything. And so you're not really a democracy. And that is why France is a shadow of the country that had the lira. Germany is a shadow of the country that had the Deutschmark. Italy is a, 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 a shadow. Uh, France, France had the franc. Yeah, uh, Italy had the lira. But Italy is a shadow of the country that had, had the, uh, the, the, the lira. Okay, so now, next. Okay. Uh, Euro area GDP per capita. This is from trading economics. Euro area GDP per capita compared to UK. This is $37,000 per year. Ours is, hold on, 37 and ours is 47. So we have much higher GDP per capita than the Euro area. Boom. Right. Stock market. I'm not particularly interested in stocks. I don't have any, but you might be interested to know that the Euro area stock market is below where it was 20 years ago, whilst ours is hitting all time highs. So we're hitting all time highs they're below where they were 20 years ago. What's wrong with you? Can't you keep up? Euro area unemployment 6.4, UK unemployment 4.3. Right, so we're, we've got low unemployment, obviously. And so people might say, well, what about the recession? Well, these are all of the quarters of GDP since the vote to leave. A recession is when you get two downward ones in a row. So two consecutive quarters of negative growth is a recession. Some people don't like that terminology because negative growth seems a bit of a contradiction. So they say two consecutive quarters of economic contraction is a recession. Um, but basically, if you get two base bars in a row, that's a recession. So there's the COVID recession there that the whole world had. But this is our GDP since the vote to leave. There ain't no recession. Okay, wake me up when it begins to exist. Everyone, like, um, economics is called the, the dismal science for, for justly, because people, the, the old joke is that economists have predicted 10 of the last three e uh, recessions. So anyway, right, this is uh, UK GDP compared to Germany's. Uh, UK GDP, blue, Germany's is the black dashed line. You'll see that our economy has been growing faster than Germany is for many years now, and if this continues, it's only a matter of time before the UK once again becomes the most powerful economy in Europe. Um, and so it's very simple. They have a failed political system, and they want us to be the suckers that pay for it. And so if this continues, it's only a matter of time before the UK overtakes Germany. So, next graph. This is how we become richer by leaving. This was our... Um, membership contributions to the EU, and this is global um, tariffs and trades. So we see that tariffs are in a death spiral, and our membership contributions to the EU are going up and up. So it's one or the other. If if you're um, you, you can either be a member of the EU and pay membership fees and not pay tariffs to trade with them, or else you cannot be a member of the EU and you pay tariffs to trade with them, but you don't pay the membership fees. So what would you rather do? Would you like to pay tar uh, tariffs that are going down and down, or membership fees that are going up and up? And the obvious answer is, you'd only want to pay the membership fees going up and up if you wanted to make yourself poorer for the sake of some crazy irrational ideology, or some lunatic belief system that you wanted to sort of flagellate yourself with poverty for some sort of moral, I don't know, Arcadia. So obviously, being outside and uh, paying tariffs is going to make you richer than being inside and paying membership fees. Uh, especially as the whole of society had to pay the tariffs, whereas uh, had to pay the membership fees, but with the tariffs, you don't have to pay the tariffs if you don't want to. If there's some EU good that's, um, that's um, more expensive because there's a tariff on it, you can buy the British goods instead. And that's something we'll be coming back to in a second, to do with the, the Keynesian multiplier. So. Okay, here is the EU market. Which market should we be concerned about? Should we be concerned about the small market with low growth? Or should we be concerned about the big market with high growth? We should obviously be concerned about the big market with high growth. If you lock yourself into the small market with low growth, then you can't control how you trade. If, you're, if you are out of the small market with low growth, you can decide how you trade, who you trade with, whatever. It's, it's your choice. Or it's your, it's not your choice, it's your voters' choice, which is much more important. Okay, so this is a graph I put together. 
I'm going to zip through this because I, I worry that when I read things it could get a bit boring. But this is a graph I put together and this is showing GDP. And this is showing, so left to right is time and GDP, this is a load of countries ranked of the richest countries in the world at the top, poorer countries at the bottom. And these are, this is the GDP rankings of EU member states. And you see there's a general drift down from left to right. The lines are going down. Why are the lines going down? It's because EU member states are being overtaken. They're, they're becoming poorer relative to the rest of the world. So, what I'm, I've got written this down. I'm going to zip through this because it always gets really boring if someone starts reading something in a presentation. But so, first of all, Germany at the top. There. Since the unification, Germany's declined from third to fourth. France in blue. Um, France, since Maastricht, France has gone down three places. Italy, black, has gone down from six to eight. Holland, green, Netherlands, um, gone down from 12 to 17. Since joining Sweden, black, has gone down from 21st to 23rd. Poland, blue. Now, Poland is on a roller coaster, it's a, an exception, because it was doing really well, it's like number 15, but then it declined and declined under communism. And here, um, hold on, um, it, the, the, the lowest point for, for, for Poland was 1990, when the, the Soviet Union collapsed. And so what we see is, the sea change for Poland was leaving the, the USSR. It wasn't joining the EU. The circle is the date when it joined the EU. So you see, Poland was going up and up and up and up. It joined the EU and it sort of carried on. But basically, the sea change for Poland, and the same with lots of other countries in Eastern Europe, was leaving the USSR, not joining the EU. And now everyone says, oh, Poland's much richer, they've joined the EU. No, it was leaving the USSR that, that made the difference. They kept their currency, so they have a certain amount of control of their economy, and, um, and, and also they're a net beneficiary rather than a contributor to the EU. So that's why Poland's doing well. So don't let people say, oh, the EU's great, Poland's doing well. Um, Denmark, black. Um, um, going up before joining in 1973, then it went down 17 places. Austria, green, this one. Um, uh, going up until it joined in 1995, then it went down six places. Romania, blue. Um, down when it was a member of the USSR, revived afterwards, and it's gone down one place since joining. Greece, magenta, down 18 places since joining. Obviously, it was completely devastated by EU membership and by the Trochia. Finland, red, down 12 places since joining. Since, since joining. Bulgaria, magenta. Bulgaria, there. Um, like Romania, down during communism, up after communism, and down two places since joining. Portugal, black, down nine places since joining. Hungary, red, down ten places since joining. Hungary, there. Now, Ireland. Now, Ireland is very different because it's a member of the Anglosphere. And it's, we'll see from this, Ireland is obviously in green. It's on a roller coaster. So one country is acting completely different to all of the other EU member states. It's going up. Why could that be? Now, if you're Google or Apple and you want a base in Europe, Ireland is closer and they speak English and you can just have your base in Ireland and your guys can fly from San Francisco to Dublin and just carry on working. It makes sense that the one country that's bucking the trend is part of the Anglosphere. And so um, I'll come back to Ireland. Well, I won't come back to Ireland, but basically, what we're going to see from this is that the one country that's bucking and changing its part of the Anglosphere, Ireland is prospering because English is their language and not because they're members of the European Union. It's, they're probably they're prospering despite EU membership, not because of it. Um, next, um, Slovakia up is in green. The green line, Slovakia, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, it's the green line up seven places in 11 years before joining. No, place, no change in the 15 years after. Croatia, black line, down three places since joining. Lithuania, blue line, is up 18 in the nine years before joining, and it was down nine places in the 16 years after joining. Cyprus, it went up 19 places. So where's Cyprus? There. It went up 19 places in the 34 years before joining, and down 24 in the 16 years after joining. 
Um, Latvia up 38 in the 12 years before joining, down 7 in the 16 years after joining. Estonia up 30 places in the 11 years before joining, down 2 places in the 16 years after joining. And finally, Malta down 2 places since joining. So, basic, sorry if that was a bit boring, but basically, you get the general idea, they're going down. Right, they're becoming poorer relative to the rest of the world. There's a free movement of good services, labour and capital mean that the rich countries can asset strip the poor countries and then that profit gets um, just shuffled off to um, tax havens, um, basically. But so, so we see the general drift downwards. EU member states are becoming poorer because they don't have, the, the people in the EU don't have democratic control over laws regarding good services, labour and capital. And the thing is, when you do that, when you have that sort of system, it means that there's loads and loads of people that can put in their tuppence worth and, and, and they have an influence over, over the people at the top. And so, what I'm going to come to next, this is just a, a final sort of thing, but basically, this is Francis Bacon, I would ask people to guess who it is, but you can probably guess anyway. This is Francis Bacon, the great British philosopher, Immanuel Kant, the great um, German, well, not German, but um, the great continental philosopher. We'll call him, if I'm calling him Germany, he, he never went to Germany. So, Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon um, is about empiricism. And so for Francis Bacon, knowledge comes to us. So the outside world, the knowledge comes to us and we are changed by it. With Kant, it works from the centre to the periphery. For, for Kant's philosophy, I won't go into this now, this is the 30 second thing of what people spend their lives studying, but with Kant, your inner being determines all knowledge and all morality. It works from the inside to the outside. And so that's, that's why, if we, if we look back up here, the UK actually zero. We didn't go up or down, really, since joining the EU. And so, we were damaged by EU membership, actually much less than countries like Greece or Portugal. And, but still, we were one of the first to leave. The first country to leave the EU was Greenland in 1979. They left the EEC without any fuss. They said, right, we're leaving. They left. Um, and so, 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 basically, how comes we were one of the first countries to leave, even though it destroyed our economy, but not as bad as it it's doing for other countries. If you, if you look at Germany or Italy or France, these are shadows of the countries that they were even 30 years ago. Like, like look, look at Spain. Like, okay, so Spain is going up and up and up and up and up. Franco dies and it goes down. So when, when Spain was governed by like a mass murdering midget, they, they, they were actually doing better than under the, than under the EU. I mean, that takes some doing. It, like, it's failing. It's not working. And why isn't it working? Because you can't feed in from the center to the, um, from the periphery to the center. It's essentially, um, it's essentially, um, uh, I, I, I don't know how much to, to go into. Uh, before, last time I was here, I started using the word church in a derogatory way, which I, which was possibly wrong, and and and, uh, and this is this is something I've spoken to Father Jerome about. But basically, um, but, but basically, let, let's define two different types of churches. Uh, there's one sort of church that I would say is a good church, and that's one that would emphasise loving your neighbour and the forgiveness of sins. That's like a decent church in my book, right? Then there's the EU, which is basically set up like a church. You've got uh, it replicates everything that's bad and nothing that is good about theology. So you've got a centralised system that's top down. You have a small number of ideologically pure appointees deciding things in secret. And that, what they want to do is they want to project their vision on the rest of the world. They want to get their beliefs and, and project that to the rest of the world. And so the, the EU is set up in a, in a manner that replicates everything that's bad and nothing that is good about theologies of the past. And so, you, so lots of people say, oh, religion's in decline. Well, the, the, the good ones are having a bit of a trouble right now because they're the ones that everyone thinks, oh, it's okay to hate those, those guys. But, but the bad religions are actually prospering. You've got the World Economic Forum, you've got the EU, you've got the BBC, you, you've got, um, yeah, 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 you've got, you've got the OECD, the IMF. These are all a bunch of ideologically pure um, appointees deciding things in secret. And it's working. Where have we seen that before? Yeah. 
It's working so the EU projects its vision on 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 the, on, on people. It says we've got a plan for you. They're the explainers. Whereas Francis Bacon in Britain, we, where the, the other the world tells us what to think, and we're changed by it. And so, sorry if I'm rambling a bit. I better just shut up there and take some questions. <laughs> but, um, I hope, that, uh, and um, uh, I'll be sticking around for about 10, 15 minutes to talk some books, then I've got to rush off to London, I'm afraid. But I'd love to stay for longer, because there are some great speakers later on. But um, yeah, are there any questions at all? Sorry. Right. 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 Right.